Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle podcast, where business owners learn to thrive as we strive. On this show, we sit down with industry-leading experts about developing self-awareness, impacting your niche, and striving to live the best life possible. Our mission is to encourage ambitious pursuits in a heart-healthy way through intentional conversation and increasing self-awareness. Why heart-healthy? Because burnout and stress are global epidemics. We're discussing tools that help you to navigate business ownership successfully. So whether you're driving to or from work right now, exercising, eating, or simply relaxing, come hang out and get ready to enjoy another inspiring episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle Show. Welcome back to another episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle. I'm your host, Jonathan Frederick. Today's guest is a high-performance expert who helps entrepreneurs amplify their focus, productivity, and energy so they can become leaders of their industry. Alain Kukshuri is the former manager of three world number one tennis players, including Novak Djokovic. To give you, as a listener, some perspective, Djokovic just took Rafael Nadal at Wimbledon. And Alan, I, I love talking to managers of high performers because these are people behind the scenes and uh, we don't get to see managers as much. I understand that you are now in a new chapter of your life, and I'm excited to speak with you on that as well. So, Elon, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jonathan. Super excited to be here. So go ahead and share with the audience where you are located currently. So I live in Israel in a city north of Tel Aviv called Herzliya. I was actually born to parents in Germany, moved to Switzerland, lived in England, also took the New York bar exam, so spent some time there, and then I moved to Israel around nine years ago. Okay. And Elon, you were breaking up in the first sentence. I think you said you were born to parents in Germany. Is that correct? I was born in Germany, in Hamburg, to Persian parents. Then we moved to Switzerland. I studied in London, took the New York bar exam. And then about eight or nine years ago, I moved to Israel. So a lot of travel. Yeah. Yeah. And the good thing is I was able to see the whole world. I saw like different cultures, different people. And that's something that I really learned to love. We usually start out the show with a favorite success quote or a saying that you may live by and what it means to you. So share with the audience what you got. Sure. So I love many quotes, but one quote that I really think of all the time is from Henry Ford, and it goes like this, whether you think you can or can't, you are right. Because this quote really, really expresses how important our thinking is and that if we have strong, positive beliefs, they will help us create our dreams. But if we have negative beliefs and negative thought patterns, then everything will become more difficult and we will see the world with a much smaller mind. So we will also miss a lot of opportunities. Hmm. In my personal journey here, I've been becoming more and more aware of the importance of just the belief and having faith that it can happen and just believing in myself to the degree that is necessary to achieve big goals. So uh, Alan, I'm very excited to speak with you today and learn from your expertise and uh, go ahead and share a bit of your journey and how you got to where you are now. You know, when I was a small kid, I was born with all sorts of um, physical and mental disabilities. I had uh, learning problems and actually in Switzerland, they wanted to send me to a school for kids with special needs. And luckily, my Mother was very persistent and sent me to a private English-speaking school, but it was my dream to get into a Swiss school. And at the time, I started becoming more interested in sports, and I became a big tennis fan around the time when Boris Becker won Wimbledon as a 17-year-old kid. And I admired these athletes because they had these goals, they had this determination, and they didn't let setbacks throw them back. So then I managed to get a one-month trial period in a Swiss primary school, and I went there and I gave it my best shot. And after a month, the headmaster of the school said, you know, Alan is a great kid, but he's just not good enough for here. And I was devastated. But I also decided on that day that I wouldn't allow other people to determine my future. And I really thought, what would a world-class athlete do in that kind of a situation? And so it became my mission to not only get into a Swiss school, but also matriculate from a gymnasium, go to a top university, study something cool like law and even do a master's. I did all those things, but I always also imagined, you know, like the world of professional athletes. I had these mind games, picturing myself being a world-class tennis player. And I was obsessed with that sport. 
And through a few coincidences, and it would take too much time to go into much detail here, I got my chance to work in the world of sports and I got my chance to manage tennis players. And within very short time, I was working with a guy who became a world number one tennis player and that led to more opportunities. I was then able to um, build up my first professional tennis event. So I also created a tennis event business and I was living my dream. I was, I was really working in the field that I always dreamt of working in. But then something new happened, you know, in life, you, you achieve one goal, but you have other dreams. I was meeting cool people. I was traveling the world. I did everything I wanted. But deep in my heart, I had this desire to find the woman of my dreams, to marry, to settle down. And I was like, somehow not reaching that goal. I was partying. I was this like never ending bachelor. I was dating girls, but either I attracted girls where the relationship couldn't work or I fell in love with girls who weren't interested in me. And when this one girl that I was in love with suddenly ran away from me from one night to the next, I talked to a friend and he really told, told me about something that I already knew and I knew about it from the world of sports and I talked to athletes about it. But he spoke about the power of thoughts, that we have these thoughts in our head, they work like invisible programs. And that unless we change these programs, we will get the same kind of results. And that is when I became so interested in personal development and in high performance. And I realized whether you're an entrepreneur, a tennis player, or anything else, we need to invest in ourselves. We need to invest in our thinking skills, in our emotional intelligence, in our social ability to connect to others, and even in our ability to find a purpose in our lives. So, so in short, that's my life. And I'm now in this second chapter because very shortly after I spoke to this friend and I started working on my personal development, I met the woman of my dreams, who's now my wife, and we actually have two kids, one three-year-old boy and one four-month-old boy. Wow, congratulations. What are the name, What are your children's names? So one is Raphael and the other is Roger. No, that's a joke because of Raphael <laughs> and Roger, etc. But one is Raphael and one is David. Oh, that's great. I, I okay. I thought you were serious at first. I was like, "Wow, you are very brave." <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> Everyone great. thinks I'm serious. Uh, I think that would be a bit too much. So let's get into. I want to hear a little bit about the whole story. And an area that does pique my interest, of course, is the the latest transition from from being in the world of tennis and never ending bachelor to where you are now. Going back in time a little bit more. Help me understand: is is being a tennis manager the same as a tennis coach? How does that work in the world of tennis? Sure. No, it's very different. Being a manager, you take care of all the commercial aspects of a player. But of course, the better the player does, the more opportunities you create. So I also think about, you know, like when the, when the player isn't doing well, I try and find good coaches and good people for his team. We talk about, you know, what's going well, what isn't going well, what could be different. We basically plan the career together usually. And then... Once the player, the guy or the girl become good, um, we evaluate commercial opportunities, we try and build a brand, and the management takes care of everything to do with regards to the opportunities that come to a player um, as a result of being a, a world-class professional. Fascinating. A thought that came to my mind there is dealing with, I don't know if you ever did or not, I could ask you, did you ever deal with a relatively difficult player just because of their level of success or mostly were they remaining very humble at that level look i think success usually changes people and then often after a while they come back to their original character or they go completely crazy or they transform and and, and something in, in between but when you become very successful life changes suddenly everybody wants to be around you everybody wants a piece of the cake so that by itself is a new situation and you create new shields, new ways of behaving towards people. Some people disappoint you, so that also triggers changes. So, I mean, I've seen everything. I've seen players who went crazy from success. I've seen guys who became more, very shy. And I've seen a few also who actually stayed very, very similar. And here, here's one of the key secrets, I think, for success for entrepreneurs and for tennis players. You want to hear it? 
Absolutely. I think the guys who really do well on a continued, sustained basis are the ones who really love what they're doing and who don't only do what they do for the sake of money. Take someone like Rafael Nadal or Roger Federer. These are guys, when you look at them, I think they absolutely don't care about money whatsoever. Yeah. And yet, they're the guys who earn 10 times more than everyone else because they perform on a more consistent basis and people like the authenticity with which they compete. Mm. Roger, for example, just signed apparently a deal with Uniqlo worth 100 million, no, I think it was three, no, I'm not sure, like 100 million or 300 million dollars with uh, Uniqlo, this Japanese clothing brand. And this is at the end of his career. He's almost 37 years old. You would think now's the time where he won't be making huge deals. And yet he signed this massive 10 year deal. I, and I, I think it was $300 million, by the way. For the high performance players who keep a level head through all of that, like we live in a world where right now you can one year to the next, you can become relatively famous just from social media, um, you know, doing things online and growing a brand, whatever it is. So what would you share with an entrepreneur or a business owner at this very moment who is starting to see quite a bit of success and they're thinking to themselves, oh man, I don't know how to handle this. People are coming up to me in public and they're starting to, like you said, you watch some of the level-headed players and they stayed about the same, but they learn how to cope with it in a healthy way. What are some healthy ways where we can create healthy boundaries and facilitate just a healthy lifestyle while being more in the spotlight? I think it's really about investing in your personal development, investing in learning how to think clearly and awarely in creating emotional intelligence, knowing how to get into your performance state, but also how to share vulnerability in the right appropriate moments, mm. learning how to build your own character, you know, thinking of the character traits that you want to represent. And then I think two more very crucial things, you know, at the highest level, you want to be a role model for excellence. So you want to really challenge yourself and love the challenge just to push your limits, but also contribute to the world, make an impact, either inspire others, be brand ambassador for good causes, help raise money, even invest some money of your own. Like just be the kind of person who leaves this world at a much better place than when you came to this world. Because once you're successful, you have so many opportunities so use them to make an impact. And ironically, when you do that, you'll probably make more money than you ever have. Mm. That's powerful. Giving back and learning how to do that. Alan, I would love to get into some questions that pertain specifically to your area of expertise and high performance. Let's go ahead into goals. How can I formulate goals and stick to them long term? Great question. So there is Two things that are really important to understand, or one big paradox to understand when it comes to goal sending. On the one hand, people underestimate what they're able to do in the long run. So when you think of your five or 10 year vision, often we underestimate like the things we could be doing within five to 10 years. And at the same time, we overestimate what we can do on the short run. We think in a week we can do much more than we're able to do or in a year we're able to hit targets that are beyond our capability. So when we want to set goals, we want to combine a long-term vision with more manageable shorter-term goals. And what I do is I break them down into one-year goals, then periodic three-month goals, then I break down the three-month goals and monthly challenges, and then these into weekly goals and then I use what I call daily power blocks to work towards my one weekly goal. Okay, so you're literally reverse engineering it all the way back from the five to 10 year vision. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. And so on the one hand, I really visualize my one year, five year, sometimes even 10 year goals on a regular basis and program my mind to get comfortable with these goals. Yeah. On the other hand, I really reverse engineer them and set them in very manageable, chunkable weekly goals. That's very powerful. For people who maybe don't practice seeing themselves achieving their goals, but not to idolize your goals, but to just see yourself as you have achieved them already is important because you have, you have to actually 
believe that you can and that you're capable of living those goals. For me personally, that's something I didn't realize until last year without actually seeing myself at a certain place, then I would never, even if I got there, it would never be sustainable. Put it into a, a vivid example, it's like you all, like for me, I've always driven a not that great of a car. And what if I went out tomorrow and bought like a super fast sports car? If I wasn't ready, then I would probably crash it the first day. And that could be like a picture for your life. If you're not ready for that level, then you're not going to be able to handle it. So I think that's very, very important, like you say, to envision that. Let me share two comments on that. Um, first of all, I love using the metaphor of a thermostat, you know, when it comes to our thinking. We have like a thermostat for all the different areas of our life in our head. And what I mean is a thermostat regulates the temperature. So if it's 30 degrees regulated for 30 degrees, in, and hot air comes in, then the thermostat will cool the room and vice versa. And we have the same with regards to our earning capacity. And, and the proof to me is you take someone like Bill Gates. What, what do you think would happen if you would stripe him off all the money he had? Where would he be in a year from now? He would make it all back and more. Exactly. And take a, a poor guy from the street, you give him a lottery ticket and he wins it. He now suddenly made five million bucks. Where do you think he'd be in one or five years from now? Yeah, yeah, good point. Probably worse off. Exactly. So the key is we need to make our goals part of our identity. And one strong tool for this, which athletes and entrepreneurs use, is visualization. And there's four keys for visualization. One is the frequency, how often you visualize. The more you visualize, the better. The second key is the duration. The longer you visualize, the better. The third key is the intensity of the emotions. Like you want to really visualize the full experience of achieving your goal, but then also the benefits, the satisfaction, the happiness, maybe celebrating with your friends and your family and seeing how your life changes in their life. And the final characteristic is the vividness of your visualization, meaning how much sense data there is, how much like how well you can hear things in your visualizations and smell them and see them and feel them. You really want to experience the event that you're visualizing as if you're actually living it right now in this moment. Touching your dreams is very important if you really want to achieve them. A lot of people will talk about them, you know, and a lot of successful people as well. They'll talk about their dreams or their next level goals and they don't truly have a conviction about their ability to achieve those goals, which is is usually the case, right? We're usually t uh, lean, lean towards insecurity, but we can be relentless and go after them regardless. Now, it's almost like you're touching your dreams. I like to actually do a physical activity as well occasionally. I will do things occasionally that allow me to touch my dream. For example, I might be traveling and I might rent a rental car for a day or two. That's like a very nice car just to touch it, just to be in it and just be like, oh, look, I can do this. And then another thing I'll do is I'll try to go to put myself where other people are who are ahead of me. So I can say, okay, like I'm getting along with these people. This is great. I'm learning. I'm a student. This is wonderful. And things like that. I might get a massage for like an hour once every couple months just to be like, okay, you know, in the future, I would like to have a massage every two weeks or whatever that is. Touch your dreams and poke them. So you're kind of getting closer and closer. I love that. I totally agree that that really helps us to be able to picture, you know, our dreams, to feel them, to see them, to experience them absolutely spot on. Wonderful. Getting into another question, what I would love to touch on the power of consistency in the mundane. And I'm sure you've seen this through the span of your career, working in the sports arena and now more on your own. If you would touch on the power of consistency in the small things so that you can truly become an outlier. 100%, you know, just doing two, three things consistently will compound together and give massive results. You, you may have heard of this um, metaphor. If I gave you a penny now that doubled every single day or $3 million and this one penny doubling every day would double itself for 10 days, what would you choose, the penny or the $3 million? Well, I'd choose the $3 million. You're right, because the penny would be like $5. After 20 days, what would you pick? The three million dollars or the penny that doubles every day. Hey, listen, I got C in math, so I'll let you take this. 
<laughs> so again, you would hopefully choose the $3 million because the penny would equal $5,000. But if you would pick the penny after 30 days doubling each day or the $3 million, I hope you'd go for the penny because you'd be making over $5 million. In other words, small efforts over time suddenly create the bombastic result. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes. I, I think about this more and more often now. You know, after trying to model a lot of, of people who are very successful, I'll notice they basically had a very slow, slow increase in their level of achievements, but they were consistent for many, many, many years. And then all at once, almost, and that's where the overnight myth comes in, but you know, following them in detail, you can see, like, let's picture a line graph. They're going up and up consistently. Maybe there's a couple dips along the way. Then all of a sudden, all at once, almost, it's like, boom, they start to see that, let the big, like a rocket launch. How, as an individual going through that rocket launch in your career, in their business, what are some ways that they can go through that in a healthy and, and maintain their health along the way? Because that is so overwhelming because you've been working for that goal for so many years and years and years and so much consistency. How can somebody handle that with a level head or should they just grab onto the rocket for the ride and just hope that it works out well? Well, there's a few things, but let me share two. First of all, it's important to really understand what we want to achieve and what the high value tasks are for that goal. Because you know, often we love getting distracted, and one reason we love getting distracted is that it makes us feel busy, but we're actually not doing much. Yeah. Great example, emails. You know, you can answer emails for five, six hours, you feel productive, you feel busy, but are you really moving your business forward? Are you adding more value? Are you creating higher value content? Probably not. So you really need to figure out what is the most high value thing that I could be working on, and you need to dedicate time every single day, ideally as early in the morning as possible. This is challenging, this is difficult, then you know you're on track, you need to love the challenge. Now, at the same time, you need to focus on recovery because people often work so hard, eventually they burn out. And they burn out for two reasons. One, people love multitasking. And when we multitask, there's like lag time between task A and task B. So we're always losing between 20, 30, 40 minutes where our mind is still kind of involved with the first task, but we're working on the second task. And so we feel drained. We're not working at our best, and that is exhausting. The second thing people do is they work like in a marathon, but in a marathon without an ending. You know, they constantly are at work or checking emails or going for meetings or thinking about their work. And they're just not allowing their machine any rest. So you want to create periodic rest on an hourly basis, like to take five minutes off, maybe one or two times during the day, like a bit of a longer break to go for a meal, to meditate, to take a walk. Ideally, stop working, like let's say at five, six o'clock and really dedicate yourself to yourself, to your friends, to your family. And then you can take this further, you know, take one day a week off on weekends and completely switch off from work. And then every two or three months, Take a vacation of three, four days, whether this is traveling somewhere or just taking a staycation or going close by to your home. You know, I think it was JP Morgan who said, I achieved more in nine months than 12 months because he needed those three months to produce at his highest level. What are some activities you recommend doing? during those rest periods. Like you can see I'm so type A. I'm already asking, well, what should I do when I'm supposed to be relaxing? <laughs> um, you know, I have this uh, concept of power blocks, like high intensity work, which I personally do for about 55 minutes and then I take five minute breaks. These breaks, I just get up, I walk around, I move my body, I might drink some water, I might take five to 10 deep breaths. Um, and then uh, I'll come, maybe I'll even call my wife or take my baby into my arms, and then I'll go back to my desk and back to work. Then in the afternoon, usually I'll try and take a 20-minute walk, you know, just to allow my thoughts to, to, to float around in my head, you know, without focusing on one specific task. I try and stop working at 4 or 5 o'clock and really hang out with my family. You know, quality time with people is one of the best things you can. And then there's one magic pill, one secret tool that will make you think better, feel more relaxed, strengthen your immune system. You know, I think in Tim Ferriss's book, um, what was it called? Tools of Titans. 
he said that he interviewed some of the leading people of all fields. And there was one habit that about 90% of the people, of the top performing people did. And I bet you can guess what that is. Yeah, what? Yeah, what? Um, no, I don't know. Meditation. Okay. So med meditating once a day for 20 minutes is a great way to recover. And it's, it's really the pill to thinking clearer, becoming more aware. And then, of course, other things you can do is like working out is really important. Hanging out with friends is really important. From time to time, spoiling yourself, taking a massage or, you know, going for a swim or going for the beach. There's tons of things. Having a hobby that you enjoy. I like that quote with JP Morgan. It's very imp impactful to me. I, I don't know if I've ever heard that before, but I've heard that concept where he's, he's more productive in nine months than he is in 12 because those three months of rest... Wow. That's really impactful. That's hard to understand, but it makes perfect sense. So how can I master sleep and use it to my advantage as a business owner? Because for me, like you said, you like to stop working around four or five. I do too, right? I'd want to do that. I A lot of times I find I get into a state of flow in my work uh, late evening, like eight to 9 p.m. Do you recommend that I just stop? because it's messing up my sleep. I will actually end up sometimes working until like four in the morning because I get very excited. Well, I used to be a partying animal, uh, a guy who hung out at clubs, came home at four or five in the morning, hated waking up early, loved going to sleep late. And that changed a few years ago. And with it, the quality of my life, it became so much better because uh. You know, do you feel better when you're like exhausted and tired or when you feel fresh and like excited and like inspired? Now, you know, some people are different, but I think for most people, these rules apply. A, when it gets dark, that's the best time for us to sleep. Like our metabolism, our like internal chemistry and everything. That's just the way we're wired, like to sleep well when, when it gets dark and to wake up. When, when the light comes. And if we struggle with it, it means that we, we built a habit of um, having different sleep patterns. Now, people who struggle with sleep, they, they need to practice a few things. First of all, it's almost unquestionable that almost everyone needs seven to eight hours of sleep. So if you don't get seven to eight hours of sleep, start increasing your sleep by 30 minutes a week at the least until you get to seven to eight hours. Next, Create like a bedtime ritual, like an hour or two. Start doing things that promote your sleep, like do not use your computer because it, it keeps you, it stimulates you. Do not use your phone. Do not check emails. Ideally, do something relaxing, maybe a hot bath or hanging out with your partner, maybe reading an inspiring book. Also, feed your mind with something positive because it will impact the way you sleep. So if you do watch TV, Ideally, don't watch something scary or disgusting or frightening. Then in the morning, make sure, you know, you, you get to a stage where you enjoy waking up, that you don't hit the snooze button a hundred times. Don't check your emails first thing because you want to be productive. You don't want other people to dictate your life by the emails they write you. And maybe ask yourself something empowering, like what's something that I really look forward to? Have a morning routine to get you energized and inspired and ready for a great day. These are things you can start doing and then you can amplify your sleep, you know, by making sure you have the right temperature, you know, like not too warm, not too cold, eliminating any lights or any things that could wake you up, making sure that your phone is closed. These are just small tips, but sleep really is everything in my opinion. It's the easiest way to become more productive because we need sleep and it's not a very difficult thing to do. It's something very enjoyable once we train ourselves to create the right sleeping habits and you will get more done not less hmm. all right transitioning into this question here what would you say to a business owner who has hit a plateau of success so they're a high performer they want to go to the next level but they're afraid to change the systems that got them to where they are now so they know they have to change, they know they have to mix it up, but they're scared to do that because they've reached a comfortable level of success. What would you say to that business owner? Very simple. He's doing well already. He had success. He's making good income. Invest in yourself. 
get a coach who is at the level where you want to go, get a mentor or study like the work of people who are ahead of your curve, invest in gaining new skills, in improving your ability to think bigger and your ability to think out outside the box and create new ideas. Also look at your life and think of ways how you can optimize the way you operate. How can you feel more energized? How can you feel more inspired? Think of ways what's going well and what could be improved. Take take a day to really reflect on yourself, you know, reflect on like what got you to where you are and what you need to do to get you to the next level. And again, usually having an accountability partner or creating the kind of environment that will push you to the next level will really make the difference. So I've actually experienced some coaching. It was, I'll say this, I didn't really like it, but it did help me a lot. Uh, the reason I say I didn't like it was because the second day, the coach called me randomly. I was actually with my family and he basically, I, I did something to go against what my initial word. So I basically broke my word, which is not okay. So he called me and he was like, hey, you said you're going to do this. Why didn't you just, if you weren't going to do it, if you were going to back out, why didn't you just tell me like a man? And I was really, at first I was like, how dare you talk to me like that? But then I was like, wait a minute, what can I learn here? So where's the line with boundaries, right? Like how can you know if your accountability partner, mentor, or coach is crossing the line with how they approach you? Of course, you know, you need to have boundaries and respect yourself to where you stand up for yourself if they're disrespecting you. Where's the line there for for a healthy coaching relationship because like I said at first I wanted to tell him you know don't talk to me like that but then I was thinking like although although I didn't appreciate he is aggressive I actually needed to hear it because it really woke me up to the fact that I was wrong and I need to change that area you know you want to research who you take as a coach you want to um, discuss the rules of engagement together mm -hmm. but you definitely want the coach to hold you accountable and to be able to tell you in a kind and loving way, you know, whether you're living up to the expectation, to the things you agreed or not. And of course, you know, there are like great coaches out there, there are bad coaches out there. So again, you want to do your research and everything comes with some risk. But at the same time, you can minimize the risk by checking the references of the coach, spending some time, you know, one-on-one -on -one for an hour to get to know who the coach is, really understanding what he's about. But again, accountability is not always pleasant. That's really one of the reasons we need a coach. And like to make us aware of the things that we don't see by ourselves. And it's much easier. You may have noticed it's much easier for you yourself, Jonathan, to tell other people how they could improve their own life than to see it for yourself. Yeah. We all have these blank spots, these... Uh, we, we want to avoid cognitive dissonance. Right? We want to be the person that we think we are. We want to yeah. frame our actions in the way that we want to see ourselves. So we'll justify our mishaps from time to time to the extent that we don't even notice that we're doing it. And that's why outside opinions are so important. And it's something we can really learn from the world of sports because almost every top athlete has not even one coach, but a few coaches, you know, whether it's a physical coach, professional coach for the career, you know, whether it's tennis or soccer, sometimes a mental coach, a high performance coach. So athletes really understand that to get better, they need help. Another, another reason for this is that to get better, we want to learn new skills. And there's this concept of deliberate practice where you set challenges that are slightly beyond what you're capable of and having someone show you how to get there and push you and correct you and give you feedback. Those are some of the reasons why coaches and outside help can be so extremely helpful. I like that. All right. A personal question, Elan. So feel free to answer as vulnerably as you are willing to do. Please share your greatest career success, but also your greatest career failure. Sure. So my greatest career success was um, it was probably managing my first client and seeing him go to world number one because it was just such a big dream come and true. And then sitting in the player box at the US Open final, it was Marat Safin in the year 2000. I've had many other um, successes, more like different successes, but I would say that was really a moment that like I will never forget. And my my biggest failure was often related to 
delegating things to other people and trusting other people, which has led often to making like uh, poor decisions like investing in a real estate project that completely went wrong or trusting a financial advisor who um, ended up being uh, fraudulent. These kind of things, just like being too casual and too trusting and not doing enough research, basically, led to these kind of incidents. Well, thank you for sharing that. What would you, we're going to go ahead, we're going to go ahead into the heart healthy hustle round, Elon. So are you ready for the heart healthy hustle round? Yes, let's do it. All right, let's get into it. So for the first category, it's heart. What activity do you use to care for and strengthen your internal character? So an example would be solitude, reflection, things like that. Cool. So I try and pick up one characteristic a month to make the theme for the month. Like this month, the theme is focus. And then I create triggers that help me really promote that theme. And I mix the theme. One month, it's a performance trait, like focus or discipline. And one month, it's a relational trait, like um, being kind, being loving, being patient. So I think that's really how I train my character muscle. Wow. What are, what are some ways uh, that you set triggers? And what do you mean in particular by triggers? Well, let's say focus is the theme of this month. So I try and make sure I really spend two or three sessions of highly focused time, even more than usual. I try and read articles about focus. I put the word focus on my phone and it rings at random times, reminding me that focus is the theme of the month. Those are the things that I mean. Okay. Yeah, I like that. For me, I take every 30 days, give or take a couple days, I have a, um, a note card I keep on my bathroom mirror and I say, by this date, I will have achieved and then I'll write down some goals. So I like that. Do you find that having specific character traits that you focus character. on... Do you find that that is more helpful for your growth and development to actually have one per month? First of all, yes. And second of all, you know, you could say, isn't it more useful to think of specific result goals, which I also have? But, you know, God forbid, you know, the day will come when you and me, we will be dead and there will be a funeral. What will people talk about? Like Jonathan, you know, he earned uh, $10 million and he, uh, he drove a really fancy car or he was a very loving dad and husband who helped all his customers really achieve their goals and who impacted the people around him in such an inspiring and positive way. That's how I came to the idea that I really want to focus on building character traits. Hmm. For you, you said, did you say you take 30 days where you will work on specific character traits? Exactly. I'll, I'll make okay. every month, I'll choose one trait as my team. Okay, cool. I do something similar. The reason I'm, I'm trying to get to the bottom of that is because I'm trying to figure out if it may be more conducive to my growth if I focus on like one character trait per month. Right now, I do kind of a throw it on the wall and see what sticks where I'll have like triggers on my phone. I might have a different pa wallpaper on my phone for the last 40, probably the last two months. I've had one that says focus and it's just focus on one course until successful. It's an acronym. So I've had that. And then, you know, the the bathroom mirror thing, but I wonder if I'm having too many, too many all at once. Maybe I should, well, uh, I'll think about you it. You know, yeah. first of all, the theme can repeat itself. You know, I've had similar themes repeat itself. I've already had focus in the past, but what you want to do, you can even do yourself a schedule for the year and think in advance of 12 character traits uh -huh. and mix them up between performance and relational traits and then really schedule them. And then for each trait, think of three to four ways how you can really remind yourself of them and, and really immerse yourself into that specific trait. So like if it's love, you could really ask yourself, like how can you really constantly think about love? You can read things related to love. It just becomes the subject line of the month. Okay, so for health, how do you maintain your physical health and avoid burnout? So I think with health, you know, there's a few things that working out on a regular basis. So I really try and go to the gym at least three, four times a week. I now started to go surfing with my wife, so that counts as working out and it's extremely fun. We all know that what we eat impacts our food tremendously. And I'm a pescatarian who's flirting with the idea of becoming a vegan, but I really try and like be very aware of what I eat. Recovery is a key, you know, when we it's good to challenge ourselves and to stress ourselves, but we need moments of rest. And we really spoke about that already. And I think um, just to add one more thing, sleep, you know, prioritizing sleep, it's so crucial. It's when 
Our brain recovers when we digest the information of the day in our subconsciousness, when our cells recover, and how we like regain the energy for the next day. Love it. So for Hustle, what is your main motivation, Elon, for doing what you do? Personal growth. I think really my ultimate value is that I think we're on this world to continuously grow and become better people with a bigger impact. And that comes through hustle, you know, like going to the gym when you work out, you you push yourself and that's how your fibers of your muscles explode and and grow into bigger muscles. And the the same thing works for anything we want to do. So hustle is the key. It can be unpleasant, but deep down, it's, it's meant to be a very good friend. So go ahead and share with my audience three of your most influential books and why. Three. That's uh, that's uh, not easy, but I, I try and read a book a week. So I think my favorite book is Man's Search for Meaning from Viktor Frankl because he really explains how no matter what situation we're in, we have a choice how to respond to that situation. It's our freedom that no one can take away and he was able to apply that in the gravest of grave situations living in a concentration camp during World War II. Oh, yeah, that's a powerful story, Viktor Frankl's. Yeah, and then another book that is less famous but that I love is called Why We Think the Way We Do and How to Change It by Helen Kogan and Thomas Garvey. And it's just maybe the book that explains best, in my opinion, how our mind works and how we can change the thoughts that we have inside our head so that we achieve the goals we have because so often we think we want one thing but we have these invisible programs that tear us into a different direction and this book really explains why that happens and what we can do about it and the third book is a business book and it's called blue ocean strategy because it's a book that really opened my mind the best and biggest businesses are not the ones who look at everyone else as competition, but rather they find ways to make the competition irrelevant by coming up with something so completely different that it becomes like a no-brainer. Take Circus Soleil. They they came up in a time when circus circuses were struggling, and Circus Soleil thought, okay, why are circuses struggling? Like animals are becoming less popular, animal rights, etc., very expensive. We'll take that out then how can we attract new audiences? We'll bring more themes from the theater and we'll combine circus and theater and we'll do it in the atmosphere of a real real circus. So they'll have like shows with compelling stories in the environment of a circus. And by doing that, they were able to attract new audiences, people who were actually not normal circus visitors. So that book really impact the way of how I think about business. Interesting. These are three books I absolutely love. Very interesting. Ultimately, the best performers with with sustainable success, they have a growth mindset. They realize that results don't come just from innate, born gifts and talents, but rather from effort and hard work. And once you have that mindset, then you don't care about setbacks and mistakes because you see them as part of the process of becoming better and becoming the person you want to become and achieving the goals that you want to achieve. Mm. I actually plan to reread those books because I'm sure rereading them will give me new insights and I'll look at them from a different angle. Yeah, I like that you brought up, you know, the importance of how we think. And then also, so many of us don't even take the time to think at all. Going into my favorite question in conclusion for this interview, uh, it's been a great time, Elon. I really appreciate you being on the show. If you, could, yeah. if you could go back in time now, back to a time where you were maybe struggling to your younger self, what would you tell him? And uh, like, what would you say if you could walk up and put your hand on your shoulder? And what, what would you say to your younger self and why? Invest in your personal development and growth and everything else will become better in life to grow and to really become your best self and then create an impact for yourself, for your family and for the people around you and hopefully even for the world in some way or another. All right. So, Alana, it's been a really fun time on the interview. And go ahead and share with my audience how they can connect with you, get in touch with you as well. Sure. I have a great gift, like an ultimate guide on mental toughness, which uh, you will have the landing page for. So, um, hopefully, they'll be able to click it. I also have a super cool 
Facebook group called the High Performance Project, where I really give the best tips I have on high performance, where I encourage interaction between high performers, and where I really try and make it a goal to help entrepreneurs and business owners become high performers and create sustainable success. Oh, that's powerful. And so I believe the, I think your assistant emailed me the link that was um, elanhakchuri.com slash Jonathan for that link, guys, for that free gift. So Elan, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it's that. It's a pleasure and I hope uh, you guys like it. I think it's probably the best guide available on the topic, um, at least the best free gift, the free guide available. And, and, uh, and I'd love to hear everyone's feedback and um, biggest wins and uh, even like ways that they think I could improve it or things that I should add. So basically, I'd love to start the engagement with anyone interested in high performance. Love it. So Alan, thank you so much for being on the show today. Coming to us from Israel, it's a lot of fun to connect with people from around the world. Uh, it's been a pleasure to learn from you and I do appreciate your time. So thank you again. Thanks so much, Jonathan. I loved it. That's been really great. And uh, you asked great questions. Thank you for listening to the Heart Healthy Hustle podcast. If you made it to the end of this episode, I want to say thank you. And also, I want you to ask yourself why. What about this episode really stood out to you? I want to challenge you to take action on that thing. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate your time and consideration to go ahead and leave a helpful review on iTunes. So it really helps the podcast grow and we can impact even more people who need this. Thank you guys for all of your support and I will see you in the next episode. Hey.